Okay, great. Alrighty, Chodesh Tov, ladies. It's so nice to see so many new faces that I've never taught before, except for Rebecca. <laughs> um, a huge fan of yours. Um, today, we're going to learn about the month of Shvat, mm -hmm. which um, is also called Aquarius in the non-Jewish calendar. And we're going to explore um, what is so unique about this month, um, what is the energy of this month that we're supposed to access, what's the potential that we can reveal. Also, um, we'll talk about what I found super fascinating, which is the actual holiday of Tu Hishvat and how that holiday evolved over time, because it's not a traditional holiday. It's something that came up in, much later in Jewish history, and it's a very creative um, attempt by the Kabbalists to infuse meaning into this, ho into this time of year. And um, in preparation for this class, I just discovered so much good stuff <laughs> that I'm, I'm just like so excited to share um, that I just didn't realize. I mean, what, what do you guys think of when you think of Tu Bishvat? What is, what's your, the first association that comes to your mind when you think of Tu Bishvat? Trees. Trees. Soil. Soil. Fruits. Fruits. Go ahead. Fruits. 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 Um, for me, I always think of this very strong memory as a child growing up in Israel. I think I was in first grade or second grade, something like that. But I, I remember um, the outfit I wore. <laughs> it was like this really cool, like hippie white shirt with like bell bottoms. In Israel, everybody wears white and blue on Tu Bishvat. And we went to um, a forest and planted trees which was so cool, like I've never ever done that before. And that to me always like, like when the holiday comes around, it always takes me back to that experience as a child planting trees in Israel and what a unique experience that is. That, and that God willing, we should all have that opportunity, us and our children to do that um, soon. And, um, and then I also think of Caribs. The carobs, those um, fruits that are halvim, that are brown and, and tough and like so hard to chew on, and they've got like this sweetish. They're just a weird fruit. <laughs> it's like duck on this holiday. It's like the one fruit we eat. I'm like, that's my association is that fruit. Um, but the truth is, as we'll learn later in the class that there is actually um, a Seder, just like Passover Seder, there's a Tu Bishvat uh, Seder. And um, there's like a whole thing that we're supposed to be doing and very specific fruits that we're supposed to be eating, plus four cups of wine, who knew? Whoa. So it's a whole feast with um, special things you're meant to say and everyone goes around the table and says something. It's a very beautiful mm -hmm. custom and tradition that I um, had only experienced once. And um, I mean, in my family, we always bless on new fruits. For us, Tu Bishvat is my mom would always get all these really great fruits that are connected to Israel. And we would, um, we would bless on them, uh, the blessing for the fruit. And then the carob, we would say Shechianu on the carob, because that's the only fruit that was different. And that's it. But one time, I did get a chance to experience a Tu Bishvat feast, but it was more like a party <laughs> at a very famous Kabbalist in New York called Rav Dov Bear Pinson. And it was really like a feast, like just like all these amazing, gorgeous fruits and tons of music and deep Torah. And just, it was so special that for me, that's like the ideal now. Like that's, that's what Tu Bishvat should be like. So I hope to share with you some of those um, customs and hopefully you'll be able to incorporate it this year. Um, Tu Bishvat comes out around February 10th, so it's soon, it's in a, it's in a few weeks. Um, and I hope to share with you some things that might be meaningful and none of it is, is really halachic, the, the, it's really more traditional and customary. Um, so where, does anyone know where is the source or the mention in the Torah uh, for Tu Bishvat? Where does it say, where does it mention that holiday? Anyone know? Genesis? In what, in what, where in Genesis? I don't know, 
<laughs> it would make sense, right? Well, there would just, be I'm just, I'm just guessing. I read a, I watched something in the Bible and the Torah. Yeah. I mean, it would make sense. It would be in Bereshit and Genesis because that's when we talk about the creation of the land and the fruit. So it would make sense that that would be the place. But the truth is there is no oh, mention. Because it's not the Deoraita. Right. Like, there is no actual mention in the Torah mm -hmm. of Tubishvat. So the source for Tubishvat is actually in the Mishnah. Um, I think it's um, Tractate Rosh Hashanah where it says that um, Tubishvat is Chagai Lanot. It's the new year for, um, for the trees. But it actually says tree. It doesn't say trees. Um, and we'll go into that in a bit later. We'll explain why does it say tree in, in singular and not trees. What, what's going on there? And there's deep secrets there so that we'll share. So really, um, when it was first mentioned in the Mishnah, when the Mishnah is part of the oral tradition, just like the Talmud, right? The Mishnah came before the Talmud. Um, basically, it was trying to explain a very specific legal law in Judaism that um, they used to tithe. Who knows what tithing means? Tithing, the literal... Yeah, what is, what is tithing? To, to donate, to give. Right. So it's customary in Jewish, um, Jewish law. Tithes are usually anywhere from 10 to 20% of what you produce or what you have. You donate... Um, Maser. You donate... At, in ancient times, they used to donate it to the priests and to poor people. So, um, because the, the Jews in ancient times were an agricultural society, what they would donate were fruits and vegetables. Mm. So, Tuvishvat was the, the cutoff point where, let's say, it's 2017 Tuvishvat. So now you need to provide tithing. It's 2017. You need to provide your tithe for the priests and the poor people for the year. So now this is the cutting off point. Like this is the time from which you can start to tithe for 2017. You can't use the fruits and vegetables from 2016 and say, hey, I want to use these fruits and vegetables for the new year. The law was like, no, this is the start of the new year. And, and the way that they um, came up with that was that it's the time when the trees are actually feeding off their own sap mm. rather than the water from the ground. That was sort of the indicator of why they determined that that would be the time of year um, for that sort of cutoff date. So it's really interesting because the, the holiday itself is... Um, is meant to be one where we focus a lot on fruits. You know, there's like this overemphasis on fruits. And I thought about it today. I was like, I'm not much of a fruit person, <laughs> more like a salad girl. But there's there's so many things. If if you were to stop and think about fruits and vegetables, what is so unique about these this food versus other foods that we eat? What's unique about them? Fruits and vegetables? Yeah. They come from the source. They're not processed. processed. They just come from nature. nature yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's pure food pure that you food. can eat ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to boil. I mean, there are some fruits and vegetables that you do. But in general, like, they're ready to go. You take off the tree, you can eat yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I think we take it for granted because we, we shop at the markets and we think that's where food comes from, but yeah. really they grow on trees and I think one of the blessings of living in LA is getting to see all these gorgeous fruit trees, like especially in our area, there's all oranges and lemons and uh, we actually, yeah. down the street from our house, we have a pomegranate tree and fig also trees, uh, fig, fig trees, tree. almond trees Apricots. and there's one, there's one neighbor that actually has an etrog tree. Nice. Oh, and there's so, it's so beautiful like to see how they they grow slowly slowly and we'll talk later about what's unique about an etrog and how um, you know there's different categories of fruits you know fruits that have shells fruits, fruits that have seeds fruits that are just you eat them fully as they are and each each fruit category has a deep mystical meaning and it represents something which is what we'll go into when we talk about the Seder and how how the Kabbalists really like took it to like the next level about fruits <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but what I what I'm trying to say here is that if you stop and think about food, as far as uh, those types of foods, the beauty of something that was created in nature and was something that we don't really have that much to do with, right? Mm -hmm. And 
first of all, the way it looks, the shape, the color, the scent, the taste, the flavor. Just like there's so much to experience there. And if you if you just stop, if there, you get one thing out of this class today is start eating, like start having a whole new point of view about your the way you eat food. <laughs> you know, just like look at it and be like, wow, this is a gift. This is a gift. And it's one, of, it's one of those few things in our modern times that I feel is so pure still, even though they might not all be organic. <laughs> no, let's not be food snobs. You know, like, just to be able to take a moment before we eat and do two things. One is to meditate on where did this come from, right? And to, and to acknowledge that, that these fruits are gifts from God, right? And, and how do you, when, when someone gives you a gift, what do you say? Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's the first reaction. You want to thank them. So how do we thank God for um, fruits high, for, for the food that we, that we give? What do we, what do we do? Blessing. We say a blessing. So in our tradition, we've got a whole slew of blessings for different things. Hi. But for fruits and vegetables, it's very straightforward. Things that are that grow on trees, you say, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the blessing so you have it. Okay? So everyone who doesn't know the blessing can now know the blessing. It's Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you God, Elokeinu Melech the um, the king king of the world. Um Boe Peli Haetz, creator of fruit of the tree. So that's it, that's the blessing. And one of the things that we'll go into is we'll, we'll learn about how, you know, by us doing that simple act of blessing on the fruit of the tree, we are repairing the greatest sin that ever happened. What is the greatest sin that ever happened? The sin of the first bad. Adam and Eve. That's right. That's the first sin. That is what the Kabbalists teach us, that by us blessing and acknowledging that the fruits and food that we eat is from God and is a gift from God, we are actually repairing the sin that happened with Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. That's how major mm -hmm. such a simple act can be, right? Because what, what, what did God do in the Garden of, uh, of Eden? What, did he, what, did he, what was the commandment that he gave? Well, what did he say he, they can do? And what did they, he say he, they can't do? What did he tell Adam and Eve? They can do what? Well, look at that thing. <laughs> but don't eat anything from the tree. From the tree of knowledge. Tree of knowledge. Which and which tree? Um, which and what were they allowed to eat from? That was what they were not allowed to eat from. What were they allowed to eat from? The tree of good and evil. The other tree. All, all the trees. All the trees. All the trees. There were everything. The garden was filled with. So they were able to eat everything, and all he said was one tree, don't touch. Right. That one tree. That's all it took is that one tree. You know, so what happened there? How did they get lost so quickly? How did they fall so quickly? And now we're all paying for that. Really, it's to do with the fact that they wanted to act they wanted to activate their 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 um identity. They wanted to assert themselves and and to say, you know what, we're gonna decide for ourselves. And they didn't want to take God's word for it, that it's better for them to just eat what's available and not all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result, there was consequences of what happened to them spiritually. Because what do we know? We know that this world is, one of the things we'll learn today is how a people or a man is compared to a tree. There's a lot of metaphors in Torah that compare people to trees. What is that about? So what do we know about trees? Trees, what are the different parts of a tree? The roots. There's roots. The branches. Branches. Fruits. Leaves. Leaves. The, leaves, the, leaves, the trunk. Trunks. Right? So what do we know about trees? There's the hidden parts and there's the revealed parts, right? But where is really, where is all the action happening really? Where is the core of a tree? And the roots, the hidden parts. That's really, that's really where it's at, you know? So... What, we're, what we learn is that um, they, they got lost in the sense of um, 
in the sense of, of wanting to assert themselves and not really taking God's word for it. Now, what was God trying to teach them? He was trying to teach them that this physical world is our bridge to the spiritual world. And that we're supposed to use the physical world as a way to connect with God. That the physical world isn't meant to be used in and of itself just for itself. You know, so many of us get caught up in the pleasures of this world and we think that those pleasures are the be-all and end-all. Like, that's really what it's for. But the truth is, the physical things that exist in the world are really there in order for us to, to connect with God. God wants us to experience pleasure, but not pleasure for its own sake, for selfish fulfillment, but pleasure for the sake of um, raising our consciousness and also to connect with God. Because what is the ultimate pleasure? If you understand that the ultimate pleasure in life is to connect with God and to have that awareness, then you realize that everything in life is really getting you there, you know? And everything in life is, is meant to, to have, get you to experience that. Um, and we'll go more into that. So that's sort of like the, the promo for this class. I'm giving you like little taste. Now we're going to dig deep. We're going to go a little more in detail over um, specific things. And we'll take it from there. So we'll start out with the Kabbalistic astrology stuff. Because that's the fun stuff that I love to teach. So um, the... Um, who knows what is the astrological symbol for the sign of Aquarius? Is it a woman holding a jug of water? It's not a woman, it's a person. We don't know if it's a guy or a girl. But yes, it's someone that's holding a, um, a jug of what? Water. Water, water. right. So in Hebrew, um, it's actually uh, called li. Li means a bucket. So you don't even talk about the person, you talk about the vessel. Mm -hmm. That really, um, this is, this is um, if the, what is water? What does water represent? Life. Life and? Torah. Uh, exactly, Torah, spirituality. spirituality, wisdom, abundance, right? Water represents abundance. Mm -hmm. So the li, the, the vessel, is, is it, does, the, does the, the vessel have any worth in and of itself? Does the bucket have any value in and of itself, or is its value the fact that it's a channel to to receive and to share? Mm. It's a content mm. to hold the water, but also to release, to the, water. To release the water. Yes. Right. So, so that's um, that's really the essence of this month. That's what it's about. Now they say, Kli. Kli okay, means okay. vessel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but but the, the Hebrew sign for this is Dli with a Dalet. Dalet Yud. Oh. Dalet Lamed Yud. Dli. 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 Oh, okay. Dli. Um, so, um, what's interesting, this is another thing that I learned, um, is that in the Talmud it says that the sign of Aquarius is the sign that rules the nation of Israel. Now, this is new to me because I thought that the way that it works is that, you know, signs are per per person, but one of the teachings in the Torah is that the signs are also attributed to specific nations. Mm. So the fact that this sign is connected to the Jewish people is super fascinating, mm. and we will learn what is so unique about Aquarius that is connected to, this, to the Jewish people. Now, Aquarius people, well, the reason why I'm going to talk about the sign is because um, not, I'm not, even if you're not an Aquarius, what, are you Aquarius? Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Even if you're not, well, you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but even, you are too? Oh, so fun. Okay, good. So, okay, so the ones who are Aquarius are going to be like this, and the ones that are going to be like whatever. So try, firstly, try to think of people in your life who are Aquarius. You have a sister who's yeah. Aquarius? Really? Okay, good. So you guys were in a room that knows some oh, Aquarius. We're good friends, so it's fine. Yeah. So what do we know about Aquarius? We know that as even a lot of people confuse Aquarius as a water sign because of the symbol of the water bear, but it's not. It's an air sign. So what did we know about the air signs? Who knows what the other air signs are? Libra. Libra. Libra and. Not Gemini. 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 Yeah. Right. 
So Libras and Geminis are the other two air signs. So what do all air signs have in common? They're all brainiacs. They are all people that love to learn. They love information. They love knowledge. They live in a world of ideas. They're super idealistic. Specifically, as far as the Aquarius, the way that um, the Aquarius is unique from the other um, air signs is that Aquarians are very um, humanistic and very much um, like they like are interested in global change. They're like, you know, like they're like the types of people that would want start like the Women's March or something like that. Like I wouldn't be surprised if some of the leaders in that group were Aquarians. You know, they're like people who are rebels, but with a cause. They're not just rebels for no reason. They have a cause. They stand behind justice, equality. They really into how can I improve the world for the greater good. And they're also extremely strong, independent, freedom-loving people. Like, very strong identity. M most Aquarius people are like, when they walk into a room, they stand out. Like, they, they, in the way, first of all, they're very stylish. So, usually I'll spot them in like, the way that they dress. Like, that's one indicator. Another thing is like, they don't talk about people, they talk about ideas. Mm. That's, that's, that's what drives them. And they're, they're knowledgeable about so many different things. Now, um, what does this mean for us? What it means is that um, even though that's what, that's what Aquarius people are like, when we're in the month of Aquarius, we're all exposed to that energy. So what does that mean? That this is a time of revolution. This is a time of change. This is a time of protest. This is a time of justice. This is a time of people wanting freedom. So if anyone watches the news, you know, this is really a crazy time. Now, what else do we know? What else have we heard about Aquarius? Anybody? What's the first, like, when you think about um, rebels and hippies and and changes, what do you, has anyone, you guys are too young, okay, has anyone seen um, the musical <laughs> Hair. Hair, right? Has anyone heard the song The Age of Aquarius? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so the age, I haven't seen it, but I know the song, but, um, but the Age of Aquarius is uh, linked to the sign of, what does that mean, Age of Aquarius? Does anyone know? What does that actually mean? In the era, actually, you know, the era. We are in the era, in the era, right. in the era of that they say the revolution and knowledge and action and leadership and exactly all that. yes, exactly right. So this means that it's a time of like higher consciousness, consciousness. that it's a time when science rules versus religion. You know, it's a time when it's more about innovation. How can we do things new? New, everything is new. How can we, we try new approaches to things? Everything is about breaking the old structures of how things have been done and starting like everything from scratch, from new. Not looking backwards, just looking forward. So that's the energy of this, of this time. And that is the energy of the age of Aquarius, which is, it was, uh, they say, started like two, three hundred years ago. And, is, uh, and according to Jewish sources, is really um, a, something that represents like the time of Mashiach, like the time of redemption, the, the Messiah coming. That as part of that, there will be more um, opportunities for equal rights, like for women and and children and things like that like that the, there's there's going to be an, an awakening in the way that the world interacts with each other that just breaks down the old barriers that have been in place for thousands of years so i think that's really exciting uh, but also scary right it's like especially now like there's so many changes so quickly it's like you can't keep up with it you know um but hopefully I, I mean, I, I try to be positive about these things, but usually change when it happens at first is like unsettling. But then when, when we'll, like 50 years from now, God willing, when we'll reflect, we'll be like, you know what? We lived during the times of Job. And <laughs> this is what it was like. We'll be able to like talk yeah. about this with our children. So <laughs> hopefully. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit more. Hold on. I'm just going to refer to some of my notes. Okay, um, so um, one of the things, like I said, you guys could reflect on my other classes, 
But um, every, according to um, Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah, um, every month of the Jewish month is ruled by two Hebrew letters. Has anyone heard this before? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically the Hebrew letters in Kabbalah are represented as spiritual d DNA of the universe. That God created the world through the Hebrew letters, which isn't such a far stretch because in the Torah it says that God said, let there be light and there was light, right? The world was created through speech. So speech is made up of letters and words. So the Hebrew letters are the foundation of the entire creation. So what that means as far as um, every month is that every month has an assigned letter. And that letter is not just a letter, but that letter is an energy force that impacts and influences what this month is about. So this month, the letter that is connected to the month of Shvat is the letter Tzadik. Tzadik, um, just, it's just like the word which actually means, what is Tzadik? A sage? Yeah. A, a righteous person. Righteous person yeah. Right, so tzedek really means tzedek. Tzedek means just, justice. So the way that this influences um, this energy of this month is that, like I said about Aquarius, right? What are Aquarius? They're people that fight for justice. It's, it's like the energy that affects them. Um, also, what we know about, um, and this is the theme that's like recurring, is just like the the the, dli, the that vessel that holds the water is like is humble, right? It's not about itself; it's just being a channel. Same with a tzaddik. A person who is a tzaddik has reached a very high level of consciousness, right? But they don't achieve that with ego. They achieve that by being super humble, right? Who do we know in the Torah was the humblest person? Moshe. Moshe, right? And who was the holiest person? Moshe, right? That's they go. They're together. Oh, if one wants to expand their consciousness and reach a higher level, they have to get out of their way. And that's actually um, one of the tikkuns of an Aquarian. Now, Aquarian people, they're very um, driven by ideals and wanting to change the world. But one of their um, their struggles is that they're not so good in like one on one relationships, and in in dealing with um, in dealing with actual like I think I don't want to say anything bad because we have a bunch of screw. It's at the weakest. It's just the weakest. Yeah, yeah. and also just so you know, there's no pure Aquarius, right? Because you also, I mean, I don't want to get too into astrology, but we know that there's other aspects. There's your Mercury, your Venus, your rising, your sun. There's all these other aspects that influence you. And when someone says, I'm an Aquarius, they're really talking about their sun sign, which is their dominant, right? Like that's the strongest character. So Aquarians are known to really be messed up when it comes to relationships because <laughs> they're so driven by high ideals that they um, almost have an ego-like problem that they um, they don't realize that they need to be more sensitive to other people. Like the best thing for an Aquarius in their in their relationships is to like like the best advice I would give is like if you're in a relationship, ask like the other person, how are you feeling? How was your day? Like really make an effort to listen and not to always be the one talking, talking, talking. Because Aquarians tend to be like super outgoing, very friendly, very talkative, very interesting, and they're, and they're fine with that, you know, but like they sometimes forget there's another person on the other end that's not just your fan, but they're like a human being that actually has like needs and things, you know, so that's the main thing about Aquarius is that sensitivity um, to other people is, is very, very, um, very important. Um, and also, the other thing I wanted to talk about for this month is um, that the main, um, I don't want to, I don't know, can you guys handle like deep stuff or should we just do surface? Because I don't know how deep I can go. Okay, we can go deep? Okay. All right. So, because there's a lot of themes here that parallel and jump over each other that it's cool to like play that game, but I don't know if you guys are up for that. Let's do it. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so um, we're going to do gematria now, okay? Well, who knows what gematria means? Numerical value. What's that? Like numerical. Numerical value. Okay, so you know, Jews are obsessed with the Hebrew letters, okay? Yeah. Let's just say that. So every Hebrew letter has a corresponding number. So Aleph, which is the first, is one. And um, Kuf, which is like, way, like Kuf equals 100. 
right? And then it, all the way to Taf, which is 400. So every letter has a numerical value. So in Kabbalah, we learned that if words have the same numerical value, like, I'll give you a simple one. Um, uh, echad and uh, Ahava. Yes, Echad and Ahava. Echad means one, and Ahava means love. They both have the same numerical value of 13. Mm -hmm. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that true love is when you feel like you're one with the other person. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, good. That's, that's a great starter yeah. mantra for you guys, okay? <laughs> so, um, so Tu Bishvat is called Chag Ha'ilanot, the holiday of the trees. Now, in Hebrew, um, the, the singular of Ilanot is Ilan. And there's some men, Jewish men, called Ilan, right? Ilan mm -hmm. means a tree. Oh, Ilanit. Ilanit, right. <laughs> um, so, Ilan... In Gematria equals 91. Now, what do we know about God? God has a few different names, and each name represents different forces or different energies or manifestations of God, right? So the God, there's a there's a name of God that's Yud Kei Vav Kei, which equals 26, and then there's another name of God which is Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, which equals 65. You, if you ever learn in the, if you ever learn davening, right? If you open up the Siddur, and you'll see God's names in a Sephardic Siddur, not Ashkenazi Siddurs, they don't spell it out. But in Sephardic Siddurs, they will use those two, in, two names. And each one of those names represents a different energy. One represents Chesed, and one represents Gevorah. One represents kindness, and one represents judgment. The other thing that they represent is that Yud Kei Vav Kei represents the upper world. It's like the divine spiritual world. And Aleph Dalad Nun Yud represents the physical world, this our world. That's why we never pronounce that name. Ever. Mm -hmm. We never pronounce that name. That name was only pronounced once at the Holy Temple. The, the high priest would, would pronounce that name once a year at Yom Kippur, and that's it. It's like the holiest name ever. And we would all like prostrate ourselves on the floor. It was like, it was like you would never hear that name, right? So now, the name that we refer to, to Hashem when we, when we were diving... The, that, was, was the that was the UK Vavke. That was the UK it's it's it, UK Vavke is four letters, but the numerical value is twenty six. So when they're referring to the name, the twenty six name, they're they're referring to the UK Vavke. Oh really? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the Aleph Dal of Nunyud, that's what we say when we say Baruch Ata Ado. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the name of God that we're referring to because that's in this world we, that's considered the physical manifestation of God's name, right? So. Um, so the Aleph Dal Nun is equal to 65, and the UK Vav K is equal to 26. 65 and 26 equals? 91. 91. 91 is the same value as Elan, which is a tree. So what does that mean? It means that, um, that a tree is really representing the union of physicality and spirituality coming into one. Okay? What's another example of this to make a little more tangible? Does anyone know what is the symbol for the Jewish people? If you were, you know how Christianity, Islam, every every religion has its own symbol, its own the icon. Star of David. Right, the Star of David. What is the Star of David? Two triangles. Two triangles. One one going up, one going down, right? <coughs> so it's the same thing as what we just said. One triangle is representing the Yudke Vavke, which the triangle that's pointing downwards represents the spiritual world facing downwards, uh, flowing its abundance into this world. The lower triangle, the one going like this, represents the other name of God, the Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, which represents the physical world, which is the vessel, which is the receiving. So when you see the overlapping of the two triangles, one on top of the other, it's showing that that's the integration of the physical with the spiritual. Because that's what Judaism is about. Judaism is about integrating those two forces together. And that's why it represents us. That's what we represent. That's our role in this world is to infuse spirituality into physicality. Not to separate them, but to bring them together. Mm -hmm. Are you guys with me? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, let's see. We did a lot of this. So we'll move on. <clears throat> yes? No, we 
Besides the fact that it's, you know, Ilan also. Yes. But it's also, it's actually 10, because it's 9 and 1, it's 10, so it's a perfection. Yes. So the, you know. Oh, you're such a Kabbalist. I love it. That's true. <laughs> because what do we have in Kabbalah that's 10 to 10? The Ten Commandments. No, uh, I mean, um, the Ten Commandments, yes, Ten Which are parallel to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, yes. But I don't know if the girls can handle the girls today. Can, Let's okay. leave that for another day. Oh, <laughs> it's too much for one day. We'll have to do a crash course in Kabbalah. All right, um, so we've covered a lot already, so I think that um, I have a whole class on being a tree, but I think I'll save that for next time. <laughs> um, let's start with um, talking about Tu Bishvat, okay? We'll get into the holiday now. How, how are we doing on time? Okay, okay, good. All right, so... Um, Okay, we talked about this part. Okay. So, I want you to understand the concept of tikkun. Does anyone know what tikkun means? Your purpose? Your... Whatever you need Fixing. to transform, Tikkun, right? Your purpose in the world. Exactly. Okay. All of those. The actual literal translation, tikkun comes from the root word letaken, which means to fix. So everything that we do in our life is really fixing. That's what we're doing here, right? We're here to fix. Um, <clears throat> When, when we, um, I'm going to be super Kabbalistic with you guys, because I just think we'll just go there. But Kabbalists are basically um, driven by tikkun. They're obsessed with this mm -hmm. idea that they can fix the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, everything that they do, they always have that consciousness, I'm doing this now because I want to repair the world. Right? So... Thing, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, if you open up a couple of six door in the morning prayers, it'll say, I am praying Shachar. I'm praying the morning service because I want to repair this aspect of God with this aspect of God, which is the male energy, which is what we said about the, the triangle going down that's considered male, right? Because that's giving. And uniting it with the female energy, which is that triangle going up, right? The receiving, right? So everything is always about repairing the physical with the spiritual, the male with the female. That's the purpose, is that union of the masculine and the feminine energies of the world. And the, the, the one going downwards is male, the one that's like representing the spiritual abundance from above coming down. And the female represents the triangle going up, which is really the vessel um, of this lower physical world receiving. So... The reason I'm explaining this to you is because what the Kabbalists did with the holiday of Tubishvat was super creative. They basically created a holiday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just decided, you know what? Yeah, yeah. If we want to make up a holiday that's really cool and <laughs> we love fruits and let's just have a party. <laughs> you know, like that's what they did basically, but it's so beautiful. Like, we're going to go through, I actually. Today was the first time I had ever actually read word for word the seder, like the actual, like basically like the Tu B'Shvat Haggadah, like the word for word like thing of what everyone says, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. We won't, I won't torture you with that, but we'll go into like little details and I'll, and I'll share with you. So why did they do that? Because they saw an opportunity. They put two and two together and they saw that there's a real opportunity with this month. They realized this month is not just any other month. This is the month that represents the essence of the Jewish people, right? We said this is the month that is connected to the nation, to our purpose as the Jewish people in the world is this month, right? So that's very powerful. That means the essence of redemption. Our purpose in the world, our tikkun, like Rebecca said, that our purpose is in this month. We have the answer to discover our purposes as the Jewish people in this world. So, 
because they understood the power of this month, that's why they were like, you know what? We can't just hold this in our heads as like a concept, as an idea. Let's create some way to, to physically manifest this idea in a way that's practical, that's a practice, that's a spiritual practice. So that, because why, why would they do that? Can they, are they, they're super intellectual people. Why would they do that? Because they know that the every man, that the regular Joe on the street who doesn't learn Kabbalah wants to have a way to connect to God. And you and if you're gonna give someone, don't just give them words, give them actions, give them things that are tangible, give them like yummy fruit mm. <laughs> to like to bite into and to really connect to God that way. Mm. Which I think is beautiful that they were able to connect the dots. Like they took something so simple, which is our daily eating habits. Our daily, every, like, what do we do every day? 90% of the day we're eating. Well, not 90%. But a big <laughs> chunk of the day is like, it's like, it's we're eating all day, you know? Like, and, and, how, and how important it is to recognize that it's not just about what we're eating physically, but what we're eating also spiritually, right? One of the things I wanted to go into if we get to that part about what it means that man is a tree is that we're, our environment, we're constantly consuming. Whether it's we're consuming information or we're consuming energies, the people that are in our lives and the energies that they rub off on us or consuming ideas from books. Like there's so many things that we're constantly exposed to that we're taking in, we're consuming. And then we have to decide what, what, what is nutritious, what is good for us, what do we want to keep and what is junk, what, is, what do we want to get rid of. You know, mm -hmm. and that I think is also a very powerful practice to take away from this is not to just think about this is the fr just the fruits, but also about everything in our lives and how we're consuming it. So, um, what they wanted to do was to help us connect to God and also to connect to the land, to the Jewish land, mm -hmm. because um, in the Torah it says that one of the signs of redemption that that we're getting closer to the time of, of Mashiach is that, you know, the land of Israel, which was a barren land for so long, would blossom. And what do we know about Israel and, you know, its amazing advancements in agriculture and how they're teaching the world everywhere how to, to, to make deserts blossom, right? Um, so that is also an indication that we're, we're getting closer and closer to that time when you know, the world will be redeemed and repaired. Um, and that's also why um, we plant the trees. The, the planting of the trees on Tu Bishvat, what is that about? It's also to acknowledge that we're, we're coming back to our land. We're, we're investing in our land. We want to we wanna make a blossom. What's the one condition in the Torah of what they say? You don't just show up to Israel and say, hey, I want to build the country. But God has to give, give you permission. It's an indication that God's cool with it. You know, like he wants you to do it. But what, one of the things that we learn is that it's not about just our actions, but it's also about like, are we doing it with the consciousness, why am I building this land? Am I bu building it because I want to be selfish and I just, I, I'd like to have some cool trees in my backyard? Or is it because I identify with a greater I consciousness, which is I'm part of the Jewish people, this is the Jewish land, I'm connecting to, to my God by serving the land. Like, to really have the consciousness behind the action of why are we planting these trees, you know? Um, so that's another really cool thing about this holiday that I want to keep in mind. All right, so now we're going to start the Seder. Um, feel free to ask questions. This is the first time I've ever done this, so hopefully you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so there's three categories of fruits. What are they? Just off the top of your head, think of any think of any fruit. Citrus. Citrus fruit. What does a citrus fruit look like? Hard Brown. shell. It has a hard shell. Do, do we eat the outside? Mm -hmm. We don't eat the outside. Okay, so let's start there. Okay, so um, fruits that have shells, the shells represent our negative aspects, our negative traits. It's our impurities, right? What do we do with shells? We get rid of them, right? We get rid of the um, the fruit shells. 
So same here. When you're when you're getting rid of the shells, what when you're eating these things, you're not just thinking, "Hey, I'm, I don't need the shell." You're, you're, it's it's supposed to represent the aspects of yourself that you want to get rid of. Mm. Okay, so that's one type of fruit. Um, now that what what the Kabbalists do is they compare. Um, you know what? We'll we'll talk about it. I don't know over over. It's too much information, so I'll go into it later. Okay, what's the second type of fruit? Which are berries? What types of fruit? So the berries are what? Do they have a shell? No. Do they have um, uh, uh, what do you call it? a pit? No. Right. So there you can eat them as is. Right. So a berry is on a higher level than an orange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, metaphorically, because why? You can eat it right away. Right. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that it's already like it's all pure. It's all good. You can have it. And what do we know about berries, actually? Berries are superfoods, and they have, like, tons of antioxidants, and they're, like, so healthy for you, right? Um, okay, so we did that. What's, a, what's the other category of fruits? With seeds. With seeds. seeds. So, well, like, what would be an example? A mango. A mango, right. No, but mango has a, sh uh, has a shell. Has a shell and, and a pit. So that's a mango's horrible. <laughs> what, a date? A what? A date. A date. Yeah, a date, exactly. A date. Exactly. So a date has the pit. Now, what does that mean? It's actually good. It's actually the next level. The next level, well, the first level will be a, a fruit with a, with a shell. It's not so great because, not meaning there's something wrong with the fruit. It's just what it means when we're, we're eating it is that it's, it, that represents the outer shell's negative, negative traits. Now, when there's a pit inside the fruit, what does that represent? It represents that the impurity is already inside of you. But, good news, what do we know about a seed? Or it grows. So you don't really chuck the seed. You, I mean, you could, but you could also plant it and grow a tree from it. So what does that represent? It represents that we could have things that are negative about us and then transform them into something good. Mm -hmm. Right? So we'll go into that when we talk. I'm just giving you a bigger picture sort of ideas before we get into the actual thing. Um, so... What is the overarching message of the actual Seder? What, what, is, what is the main theme and idea? Is that the whole point of this whole practice is that we want to cross that bridge between us and God. We want to use the physical world as a way to experience pleasure. And God wants us to experience the pleasure, but not pleasure for its own sake. It doesn't end there. It doesn't end with like, oh, I'm enjoying the fruit. It's so yummy. Done. No, it goes beyond. I enjoy this fruit. I'm so grateful that I have taste buds. I'm so grateful that I have a body that knows how to digest this. I'm so grateful that I can smell this amazing citrus fruit. I'm so grateful that God blessed us with this amazing gift. Like, how good is God to us that he thought of all these really cool, creative, colorful fruits and vegetables to like, he could have just made us like the plants where we just like get some air, get some sun, and we're good. <laughs> Sometimes I wish that would be easy, yeah, it would make my life easier, but no, like, we have so many foods to choose from, you know, um, so to really see that this is God's gift to us, and to acknowledge it as a gift through the blessings, by us blessing, by us acknowledging, the, and making a blessing as a way of saying thank you, thank you for this gift, okay, so that's sort of like the big picture, now, what do, you, what do you need to do? What do you need to prepare for this? You're going to need four different kinds of wine. <laughs> we'll start with that. <laughs> this, this totally blew me away. I've never heard of like, you know, a Jewish party. You have to have four different kinds of wine. But you do. And they have to be from the palest wine, like white wine, to rosé, to uh, blush wine, to red wine. So basically, the, the point here is that you're starting out with like, uh, white and you're ending with red, okay? And another Kabbalistic crash, like little shortcut I'll teach you, white in Kabbalah represents, who knows, what does white represent? God's light, oh, all the colors, uh, purity? Purity, okay. Right, it represents purity, it also represents kindness, chesed, 
energy. Well, if we if we do the crash course on Sphero, then we'll get into that because mm -hmm. each Sphero has a color. Mm -hmm. um, so so Chesed is the white wine, and then slowly slowly the wine goes into red. Red represents Gevura, which mm -hmm. represents judgment, which isn't a bad thing. Why? Think about it as a child, right? If your parents always said, yes, 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 you can have this, you can do this, you can go here, you can go, how great would that be? <laughs> In hindsight, not so great, but as a child, you'd be like, yep, that sounds good, right? And then, and then when parents say, no, you can't now, maybe later, not today, that's Gavura, right? That's creating the boundaries, the, the, the borders. So that's, that's, what, um, that's what that represents, why? Because you can never, you can never have full actualization of something on either spectrum. It has to be both. It has to be an integration of both, which is tiferet. Tiferet means the middle column, right? Right energy is chesed that represents giving. Left energy is um, gevura that represents taking. So, in a perfect world, or I should say, in a good relationship. It's, there's give and take, right? There isn't that imbalance of one person receiving more, one person giving more. Everyone's like in balance, and that's what creates the harmony, which is the tiferet, which is in the center. So that's um, that's what we're doing here: is that we're we're sh we're showing the spectrum of going from potential to actual. That that's what um, and and the the reason why Dafka now in this holiday we do that is because we're coming out of the winter months where winter there's not anything growing and now we're going into the months where things are blossoming and coming into their own and and, and actualizing themselves which is supposed to um, be something not only that happens in the physical world but also happens within ourselves. Okay, so um, this is how it starts. So you we get the wine, right? We have four bottles of wine. We need to have um, the seven species, right? Um, that are connected to the Jewish land. Now, who knows what the seven species are? Just call them out. What are the seven fruits? Pomegranate. Pomegranate, yes, my favorite. Dates. Dates. Olives. Olives. Yes, yes. good one. Figs. Barley and wheat. Figs, barley, wheat. Good, one more. Just one more. It starts with a G. Like a, a different? No. Grapes. Grapes, Grapes. Grapes. exactly. Grapes. Seven. Okay, so wheat, barley, olives, dates, grapes, figs, and pomegranates. Okay, so we eat um, those, plus more, and we'll go into why. There's more fruits that we want to eat, um, but those are the core fruits that we'll have, and, um, and then you need the script. Okay, you, you, there is an actual script. You can print this out online, it's available. There's like a set script of what you say. And, and basically the script goes through um, things. There's a leader of the, of the sitter that like leads it, but then the truth is it's very interactive. As you go, as you go through the seder, there's different sections that different people have to say. Right? So that's fun. I think that's a really cool thing to do. Like, I'm actually, like, thinking of hosting one of these things and, like, uh, maybe just us, this, this group, are just, like, really experiencing it because it sounds like a really fun um, thing, you know, and, to really, and there's, like, activities and questions. It's like a whole party. Um, okay. So I'm going to go through it in five minutes, okay? We're just going to go through it just because it's very important for me that you guys actually know what we're talking about and we just don't, don't get surface, but we actually go into the details. Okay. So the first question they ask is why, right? That's always the best question to start with. Why do we celebrate the new year for the full for the fruit trees on Tu Bishva. Now, I gave you this answer already, so I'm testing you right now. Why? Why do we do, why do we celebrate um, the new year for the fruit trees, Dafka, during Tu Bishva? Why Tu Bishva and not December? Why Tu Bishva and not February? Why Dafka this time? I gave you the answer. Right after the winter. Right after the winter. But what, what happens that's unique to this particular day? Day or month? To be Shvat this day, because we're celebrating the holiday. <laughs> What's that? You, I did. I do you want a hint? 
Or do you want to yeah. do 50-50? Okay. What do you want to do? Okay. <laughs> All right, so do you want to do a hint? Okay. So it starts with, um, okay. It's something to do with um, people who are in need. Oh, because of the moss or the 20%? The oh, this is when the fruit and angel starts to bloom again, yes. or not bloom again, but it starts the, again. the sap, the sap, right. the sap, the sap in the trees, right? right? And therefore, what? You start to regrow the fruit, right? But what, where, remember, we talked about the source. Where was the first time that they mentioned this holiday, and why did they mention it? What was the context? That they mentioned it in the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, why? Um, it was the Gan, Oh, in, in relation to um, we talked about the Ilan and um, it was a donate to no. the free stand. Oh, the donate, yes, donation to them. And you donate to when you regrow because it's been abundance and it's a new year, you can't use like the previous fruit. Exactly, so, good job. <laughs> Exactly. It's basically related to the halacha, the law of tithing, mm -hmm. where they don't want you to use last year's fruits. They don't want you yeah. to give the poor people leftovers. They want you to give them new stuff that's healthy yeah. and nutritious, not like fresh. leftover fresh. Right. They want fresh fruits and vegetables. That's very fair. That's an easy way to remember it. So that's why um, they said this is this is the cutoff date. This is the new year for the trees. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what that's what they that's how the seder starts with asking why do we do this now? Okay, and they chose that date for the they chose that day as the seasonal stuff. Exactly, exactly. Um, next, then um, then oh remember we, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Then it says in the Mishnah it says. Um, in Mishnah Tractate Rosh Hashanah, it says Tu is the is the new year for the tree, singular. Why tree and not trees? We didn't answer this yet. But anyone know? That's in the Mishnah. Because yes. The geometry of the Elam? There's so, one tree of knowledge. Yes. Cha Ching, you're doing so well today. You're up to like 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, exactly. Um, because the tree, what tree are they talking about? They're talking about one tree. They're talking about the tree of knowledge. Exactly, the tree of knowledge of um, good and evil, which was in the Garden of Eden. And why are we, um, why are we mentioning it here? Because what do we say? What is that? What is the big thing that Kabbalists are obsessed with? Tikkun. Tikkun. So this is an so the, opportunity to transform exactly. the blessings yeah. of to change the, the you know the the, 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 the the curse of the the first thing. Exactly. So they're telling you straight up from the beginning what we're doing right now is a tikkun. We're trying to fix the thing with the tree, one tree, not all trees. There was just one tree. Right? So that's what this thing is about. It's about trying to repair the mistake that happened with that one tree. Okay, then they are like, okay, we're going to meditate. <laughs> so what's it? They're like, okay, take a few moments and think about how you're sitting in front of God, right? And you're, you're in the Garden of Eden in front of God and you, you want to acknowledge God's goodness and everything that he's given, given us. So that, that's the first thing they're like, this is a holy experience. Okay? Don't go drinking those four bottles. <laughs> it's not pouring. It's too much bad. Let's be serious. Okay? So that's, um, that's the meditation. Okay. Now we talk about um, the Kavana. What was Kavana is another Kabbalistic word. You guys are learning all the big Kabbalistic things today. Kavana means intention. What's the intention of what we're doing? Again, I'm going to read it to you. Okay? This is what everyone says, and because this is this is everyone on the table has a script, and everyone says the same thing. They say, Adam and Eve erred. I don't like that word, but you know what it means. By eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to correct this mistake, we eat our fruit today with pure intentions, as if from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's out there. It's not someone's thinking or meditating. We're all saying it. We're all together saying it. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to fix that mistake by eating our fruit with the right intention. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now, 
just so you know, because I, I, I need to correct myself because I didn't mention this. Who came up with this, right? I said Kabbalist, but who's really, who's like the mega Kabbalist? The Ari. That's right, exactly. The Ari was the one. Do you guys know who the Ari was? Um, Rev. Isaac Gloria. He was, um, he was really a revolutionary Kabbalist because there were other Kabbalists that came before him, but he was able to come up with a system of understanding Kabbalah in a way that was very systematic and clear. And so that, in that way, he was like a bit of an Aquarius <laughs> and very much like re revolutionized the whole system and in a way that's so creative because he's the one that came up with this. So he gets the credit for this um, Seder. Okay. Um, next, uh, the setter continues, okay? The Talmud says that someone who eats and doesn't say a blessing is considered a thief. Mm. Why? Because every aspect of God's creation is holy. So when one eats a piece of fruit, he's depriving the world of a piece of holiness. A blessing reinfuses the world with holiness. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next, eating to the body is what knowledge is for the soul. When we eat, we internalize the good part of the food, and through that we grow and develop. Similarly, when we learn a new piece of information, we must chew it over, digest it, integrate it into our very being. Only then can we, go, can we truly grow in wisdom and spirituality. So now they're giving a bigger picture. They're saying, we're not just talking about fruits today. We're talking about everything that we take in in our world affects us. And we need to digest it, integrate it. Do we want this? Do we not want this? Is this good for us? Is this not good for us? So they're trying to give you a higher consciousness of not just um, what's connected specifically to this holiday of the trees, but in general, as a consumer of things, how, how you should be clear. Okay, now we start to eat, finally. So um, in, in Judaism, there's like a, um, an order of like what you're supposed to eat first. Like, there's things that you can eat first, right? So the, who knows, what is the first thing you eat? If it's not, if you're not washing for bread, and you're just blessing on just food that's available, what's the first thing you start with? I don't know, the grains. Exactly. So you start with the grains. Um, you eat, if you want to wash, there are some people that will wash for bread, so you can. So you could have wheat or barley. But otherwise, people will just have a cake or something that has um, wheat in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that people eat. And then, um, we, we say a blessing. Everyone says the blessing out loud so that everyone says amen. And we acknowledge, um, God for what he gave us. And then once, and then we start with the fruits. After we eat the grains, we eat the fruits. And we, and they specifically say that there's an order. I mean, they say you can just eat whatever you enjoy most if you want to, but if they, they recommend starting with olives first, and then dates, and then grapes, then figs, then pomegranates. Why? I don't know. Hmm. But we could analyze it if we think about um, maybe the different categories of what we said. Because olives and dates both have pits, right? Grapes, do grapes have pits? Sometimes. Sometimes. Figs, oh, figs don't have any, figs you can eat right as they are, so that's like, and pomegranates have a lot of shell, um, so I would have thought that it would be the other way around, that you start out with the one with the shell, and then you go up to the ones that have no, no pits, but I, I don't know why. Okay, so then. It's a, isn't it like a tradition, like, because, like, like, I come from a Sephardic family. Yeah. And we, we do the seven species first, by the way, by the order. Could be. Okay. I think that's probably what it is. That's like yeah, and this is probably the... I mean, I've never seen it like this before. But maybe that's what it is. And then um, you choose a new fruit, like separate from this, like a whole new fruit. And you, so what do you say when you eat something new? Shech Yanu. It's a special blessing called Shech Yanu, which means thank you, God, for bringing us to this point that we get to experience this amazing new fruit. Okay. Um, and then they have a whole thing where the participants take turns, where we read special sayings about each fruit and vegetable and what it represents. So, like, I'll give you one example. When we eat the, so we'll go around the table and like, when we'll, we'll talk about olives. So we'll say, just as the olive oil brings light into the world, so do the people of Israel bring light into the world. You know, like just to to show like that there's more. Um, 
okay, for the dates, they'll say the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. The righteous are fruitful and sweet, just like a date palm. So like that, you're getting the, the you know, the, the idea is like they, for each, for each fruit, they have a saying from the Torah of like, what does this fruit represent? What is it? What, what's the bigger meaning? And then now we're going to do the wine. <laughs> now it's like the four, the four cups of wine. Um, and like I said, it starts out with white and it gradually gets darker until it's like totally red wine. I want to read to you. Um, white wine represents nature and potential. Red wine represents nature and full bloom. Um, on this day, we begin to leave the winter behind and move into a period of renewal and life. And I already explained to you the idea of chesed from going chesed to gevura. We talked about that. Um, now, this is getting super deep, so I don't know how deep we want to go. But basically, um, in Kabbalah, we learned that there's four... Um, how do you explain this? Four spiritual realms. Basically, they really represent consciousness that the higher you go up in your consciousness, you, you get to a higher realm. And so what they're trying to teach us here is that um, each fruit category corresponds to a specific realm um, of spiritual consciousness, right? I mean, we already went through the fruits and we explained, like, what, but that's what they go into here. Um, and we already did this, so I'm, I'm going to spare you. But basically what they do is they go through the fruits with the shells, the fruits with the, with the pits, the fruits that are fully edible, and they, they say, okay, now we're reaching this level of consciousness because we're eating this type of a fruit. Now, the last fruit is, anybody want to guess, what, it, what it, how does it finish off? What is the last fruit that they finish the Seder with? Can you give us a hand? The, t the what? Tamar. Tamar? No. The cake, the mezzanot. No. The watermelon? The watermelon? No. It's not the grapes. The last fruit is the etrog. Oh, it's Yeah. And, but it doesn't have to be an etrog. Because it, it, it's hard to get them. Right. Especially around that time of year. But, uh, but what they say is, um, why an etrog? What, what's so cool about an etrog? The smell. Yeah. The smell. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that smell. So they say if you can't get an etrog, just get the best, um, best fragrant fruit you can find. I can't think of any other fruit that would be as... Lemon? Um, maybe lemon, right? It's grapefruit. Grapefruit is also pretty um, fragrant. And what's the point here? Why, why does it need to be a fruit that has a, a great smell? Because smell is the sense that is considered the most spiritual sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's why in Havdalah, right? right? And um, when we do Havdalah, why do we um, smell the Vesamim? Smell the, 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 the smell of, of heaven? Right, but, but also because because on Shabbat we get an extra soul, right? And then and then um, when Shabbat goes out, it's like we get we feel a little down, right? Because I don't know about you, but I do. <laughs> so so it's supposed to be something that like uplifts your spirits, like the the fragrance uplifts your spirits, and it's supposed to represent a spiritual experience. Um, so that's how you finish off with the most fragrant fruit. Doesn't matter what it is, but they recommend the the etrog. Is there a smell that? Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Is that included? Yes. The smell. Of, the said the smell of heaven. Like I, I guess you know that's that's the tradition. Yeah. I grew up on the smell of it. It's a most strong sm sense sense of smell. So I guess uh, you know. Yes. Connect with the sense of heaven, so we can. Well, well, it's also um, related to in the word um, in Hebrew, neshama, which means soul, is the same letters as neshima, which means breath, mm -hmm. right? Because God uh, uh, breathed the soul into Adam, right? So the sense of smell or breathing or air is connected to um, spirituality or the soul. So I think that's, that's the connection. All right, so after we finish eating, and the wine, the cakes, the fruits, everything, we finish off 